character you have given me and hopefully you are changing me to be more like him in the places that I lack. So uh, a couple of announcements. Today is a potluck day. We've got some things over in the hall. Come and join us even if it's for a cup of coffee or tea. Put your feet up for a minute. Okay, great. And next one. Uh oh. Ah, okay. From Psalm 32, which is good to read the whole song, so you can see it in context, but I did just pull out a few verses um, that meant a lot to me this week. So if you would like to stand, we can uh, say this together, or you can just read it on the screen, or just listen. Psalm 32, verse 7, and then verse 10 to 11, from the ESV version. <clears throat> you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Many are the sorrows, sorrows of the, the wicked, wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice for righteousness, and shout for joy, all of you upright in heart. Let's pray together. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for bringing us together again on this Sunday. As cold as it is, Lord, thank you for the heat that's in here, and thank you for your love that is in our hearts. Help us to... Um, Give back to you this week uh, the glory due your name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I apologize for the uh, low notes this week. <laughs> well, you can feel free to sing that song. My Redeemer lives.
is one we did last week. So I thought we'd play it again just to keep it in our mind.
that going to be your song for the from now until whenever eternity ends? Eternity doesn't end, so mm -hmm. Have you been singing this week? Have you been recalling some scripture songs to mind or some hymns or some spiritual songs that you have shared with somebody? Christmas songs. There's a lot of good theology in some Christmas songs, and we begin that next week. It's the first week of Advent. If we can get our stuff together, we'll have a, a little surprise for you each week. And I say if because you never know what the Lord is going to throw at you this week. That's your seat. And we can also pray for us as a church and uh, one of our sister churches here in town, um, just kind of by way of announcement and, and prayer. Um, next Sunday, in fact, the next two Sundays, um, we're going to be meeting with Victoria Christian Faith Church. Uh, this is one of our sister churches here in town, part of the BC Baptist Conference. Uh, currently, they, they're meeting at North Douglas uh, Pentecostal Church on Jolly Place. Anyone mm -hmm. knows where to go? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a big church, kind of corner of McKenzie and the Pat Bay Highway. And uh, they're a group that uh, make us look huge. So there's not many, 12 to 15 people, but that's not much more than us, really. But um, they're going to be meeting with us here next Sunday. Their church is coming to celebrate a uh, service with us on December 3rd, first Sunday of Advent. And uh, we're going to celebrate together. Pastor Ron Benty is going to come, and he's going to bring the message, our first Advent message next Sunday. And so I'm looking forward to what uh, he has to share. Uh, this is with um, what we're calling a revitalization with BCBC, trying to just kind of uh, stir up both of our churches with the possibility that our churches could potentially merge and become one family, even though we are one family, right? We meet in different places, but we're all one family. This church and every other church that preaches that Jesus is the Lord and that he is God's son, we are the church. So we're, we're very kingdom minded, but we're also wanting to be responsible in terms of how we can put all of our gifts together as the church and keep building the church along with Christ. Because he's the one who says, I'm going to build my church, right? It's, this is Jesus' work, is what he does. But uh, we're thinking that it might be advantageous because we're both two small bodies renting spaces. They're renting a huge space that... Um, Sanctuary, there are seats of, I think, 350, and there are 15 people. And so they feel a little overwhelmed in the space that they're in. Uh, so they're going to come meet with us on next Sunday, December 3rd. The following Sunday, December 10th, we're going to travel. We're going to go visit their church. And they are going to lead. So let me step back just a minute. When they're here, we're going to lead worship and Advent and our, our fellowship time together here. Ron speaks. <laughs> Vice versa, when we go to their church on Sunday the 10th, we're going to meet at 2 p.m. at 675 Jolly Place at North Douglas. I'm amazed I remembered that number. But uh, we're going to be there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. You get to sleep in on the 10th. We won't be here at 10 in the morning. We're going to meet over there. We're going to take and intentionally meet there and have fellowship with them. They're going to lead worship. They're going to lead the service and Advent. And I will share a message on something around Christmas. Um, so that's going to be next, the following Sunday, December 10th. So mark that in your calendar. So next week, special time together. We're going to enjoy some fellowship time afterward. Just coffee, tea, maybe some snacks. Uh, nothing, you know, big fancy meal or that, that thing. We just want to enjoy some time of fellowship and get to know them. And then we're going to do it again the following Sunday. So in the background of all of that, uh, both Pastor Ron and I are, are going through some stuff, as is our board, uh, going through some, some things, just trying to Determine who are we as churches? What do we bring together to the table that could possibly grow this kingdom movement a little bit more? I'm excited about this. I think this is a good thing uh, for both of our families to, to look at what we have together and do more to reach this city for Christ because that's why we're here, right? We're not here just to puff ourselves up. We're here to reach people with the gospel and let the Holy Spirit do amazing things. And together... We can do probably a little bit more. Amen? So, and they have kids. So, Ron's wife is going to run a, a kids program next Sunday. So, if you've got uh, some kids that would want to come, there will be one next Sunday. And so, we're looking forward to that. Um, it's going to be neat. I'm, I'm excited about this. What a neat little Christmas present. Thank you, Jesus. 
So let's be in prayer about that as well as we look at what God is doing here in our city amongst us. Amen? Amen. As we open your word this morning, God, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to see, hear, and understand what it is you have for us today. That we can glean from your word something we can take into this life to bring the gospel to people who need to hear. In your name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Walking in the light, which is a little harder today because it was so foggy this morning. Um, it, it seemed a little bit dark, so it's like, okay, we're talking about light. So you know, I love turning the lights on and getting downstairs, getting things brightened up. I'm thankful for light in here. Um, I'm thankful for a season that's, you know, less than a month away now. What's today? The 26th of November it means Christmas is less than a month away. We can actually say that now. And we're going to start preparing for that season, um, not just because we celebrate Jesus as a little baby. You know, that Advent happened 2,000 years ago. But he's coming back. And he's coming back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords to rule forever. Here for a thousand years, but forever in eternity with his church, with his children. And so we're celebrating that he's coming again. And so we go through these themes of joy and love and hope and peace. Things that we're, we have only because of Christ. Things that we can have, that anyone can have if they will submit to him as Savior. But uh, this season that we celebrate is often filled with light because it is often dark at least up here in the Northern Hemisphere, right? It gets dark and what, you know, 4.30 now, it's getting pretty dusky. By 5 o'clock, it's pitch black. And we kind of go, Ugh. you know, now what do we do? It's all dark. Oh, we turn on the lights. So that's something I actually kind of like about Christmas lights. That brings some light and some color. And if in there somewhere, people are thinking, well, I'm doing this because of Jesus, then there's a glimmer of hope, isn't there? And that's where I always start with Advent themes. I always talk about hope. Today we're going to talk about uh, something a little different, though. We're continuing our series through 1 John. And instead of hope and peace and love and joy, which are always good, we're going to talk about warnings, red flags, potential threats. Sound exciting? Both to individuals and to the church. We're going to think about what we're doing with our time, what we're doing with the life we've been given while these tickers are still ticking. Does this sound interesting to you? Oh, you sound thrilled. <laughs> Wait, oh, man, how long is this sermon going to be? Not too, too long, because we've got potluck lunch afterward. And thank you all for sharing and bringing part of that. So I hope that you are excited about it, though. That every time we open God's Word, we get a little bit about, you know, what's God going to tell me today? Don't be worried about what Pastor Steve might say. What is God saying? What is God saying to us? What is God saying to you? What does God want to speak into your life today? What is the Holy Spirit stirring up in your heart? Every time we open up the Word of God, it's got something to tell us. I believe that. And so I trust that as we do so and as we journey through it, God is working. Amen? So 1 John, and we're in chapter 2, looking at the, the last portion of it here from verse 18 uh, through to about 27, 28 here. And reading from the ESV this morning. Children, John's writing to us, as, and he's writing to new believers, people who are, are young and we are God's children. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, oh, here we go, so now many Antichrists have come. Really? Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. I'll explain that in a second. But they went out, that it might become plain that they are all not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. 
That should be underlined in your Bible. That is a powerful statement against anyone who says they have the way if it's not Jesus. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you've heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you've heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from Him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. Do we close the book right there? Explain that in a second too. But as His anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in Him. Remain in Him. Amen. Amen. It's late, isn't it? You ever hear of the doomsday clock? It's um, a proverbial clock that was started years ago when nuclear war was a big threat to the world and leaders decided that you know we, if we should just let people know that it's, it's dangerous. You know, it's quarter to midnight, midnight being the end of all things. Five minutes, well, we're getting real close. A couple of years ago when the things were starting to rumble up between Ukraine and Russia, the clock was getting set toward about a minute to midnight. Now you've got war in Israel. I haven't checked lately what it's set to, but I imagine that second hand is getting awfully close, at least as far as the world is concerned in terms of fear of the end. It's late. It's late in the history of the world. Bless you. Many ages have come and gone. We've had all sorts of ages, all sorts of empires. They've all risen and they've fallen. And there have been... And there are now wars, rumors of wars, all sorts of saber rattling going on all over the place. If you're a watcher of the news, if you read up on media, if you open up the paper, you see that our world is in a mess. It is in turmoil. It's, it's just seemingly disastrous. But there's also wars of all different kinds, wars in courtrooms, as people fight over what is right and wrong, what's acceptable. Wars on the school grounds. Wars in the schoolroom over what can be and should be or needs to be taught as people fight against what is right and what is wrong and what our kids are being indoctrinated with. There's wars in the home. There's wars in family as to what family even is. And people are fighting and arguing and getting up in arms almost about what is a family, what constitutes marriage, and what is right. There's even wars in the church. Divisions over everything from the color of the carpet to what version of Scripture we should be reading to the style of music to what time of day or what day we should meet. Who should speak, who can speak, who shouldn't speak. All sorts of things. And we fight and we're divided. And there's one who laughs at it all. And his name is Satan. As long as we're divided and fighting amongst each other and not getting together, and not agreeing on things, he feels he's got the victory. But he is a defeated foe. And we can never give in and think, well, that's it, the world's just gone to hell. Not yet. There are millions upon millions of followers of Christ working to spread the good news of the gospel in the hopes that some, any, many, would come to faith and that we would get over all this fighting and become the children and the people that God intended us to be from the beginning. But I'm afraid it's going to take something like Jesus coming back to really make that happen. One day. And we're waiting for that one day. There have been disasters in the world. Natural, man-made, all sorts of stuff. Things that you know they say are and have never been seen before. Crazy earthquakes. Fires, tsunamis. Global warming, oh, we're getting hotter, and boy, we're getting colder. 
I've shoveled enough snow in the last couple of years. Amen? Our planet's in an uproar. It's inhabitants living in suffering and turmoil, confusion, and bitter division. These are what many have called the last days. We're living in the last days. Would you agree with that? Is it, do you feel that like we're there? We're in the last days? Well, John calls it a little something more striking here, doesn't he? He says it's not the last days. He said it's, it's the last hour. That's 60 minutes. And he wrote this 2,000 years ago. That's a long hour. It's been the last hour, if you want to define it, since the death and resurrection of Jesus. This world has been anticipating his return and, and God reestablishing his kingdom on the new heaven and new earth ever since that moment, since God made a way for anyone to come to him. It's been a while. Unless you think about it in God's timing. Where he says a thousand years are like a day. So 2,000 years, eh, it's just a couple days. Time goes by differently when you're outside of time. But it is the last hour. Do you feel rushed when you know it's the last hour before something? Whether you're preparing for work or heading out to school, uh, maybe it's a big meeting at the office, maybe it's a first date, maybe your wedding, maybe it's a date in court. Maybe it's preparing a sermon. I have admittedly, you know, come to church thinking I was prepared, arriving here and realizing God has something totally different. And it's to say, nope, we're not going there today. <laughs> say, okay, God, what do you got? And you talk about being nervous and feeling a little rushed. It's like, okay, Lord, you don't want this. What do you want? Speak to me now because we need to talk about something here. Could be anything. There's something about the last hour, those last 60 minutes before a big event that brings up feelings of maybe nervousness, anticipation, what's going to happen? Excitement, oh, I can't wait. Fear, oh no. Maybe even dread. It's coming. It's coming. It's inevitably coming. It's the last hour. But those feelings, those you know, nervous and anxious feelings should only be evident if a person is truly unprepared for what's coming, right? If we know what's coming, should we fear it? If we know what's coming, that means we have time to prepare for it, right? So if Jesus is coming back and we know he's coming back, should that make us afraid? Should that make us terrified, nervous, anxious, dreading? Of course not, because we know what we need to do. If we're confident and knowledgeable about what's going to happen, we should have nothing to fear. Jesus himself tells us that in the last days, many bad things will happen. These are signs of the end of the age, what he calls the beginnings of the birth pains. So when bad things happen, and those of you women who have had children and experienced labor, you know what that's like. Husbands who've been there and felt your wife crush your side with her hand, know some pain, right? Uh, those of you who maybe have, have witnessed, you know, labor pain is intense. And Jesus says, all these bad things, that's just the beginning of the pains. Not to terrify us, but to prepare us. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we read what these times will be like. Paul wrote, understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. So anyone who thinks that the act of coming to faith in Christ is going to make your life just wonderful and everything will be perfect all the time, uh, no. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, <gasps> brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Does that sound like the times we're in? Oh, does it ever. You're not the boss of me. You can't tell me what to do. I can do whatever I want to do, and I can call it good. Scripture says, avoid such people, for among them 
are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sin, led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. That is our world. People are looking to understand things, make a new way of looking at things, try and create some kind of knowledge that'll back up their way of believing that I don't want to follow Jesus, anything but Christ. I've said for a long time, we're, we live in the ABC generation. Anything but Christ is where this world wants to go. These things must happen though, right? Scripture tells us that. It's awful. We don't like it. I don't like seeing people suffering. I don't like seeing people divided. We don't want people to be hurting. It, it pains me when I see people getting so far from God and I know what their eternal destination is going to be because they've chosen to walk away from Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And they live a life that is absolutely contrary to it. And it should break our hearts. And it should make us want to reach out to people. The question is, do we? Or maybe, why don't we? Do we really care like Jesus did? These things all have to happen in preparation for Christ's triumphant return, the, the Advent season that we're in now, His, His reign on earth for a thousand years. Not just a couple days. A thousand years. And I don't know if that's in God's timing or ours. Because a thousand years would be a thousand times 365 days. Time. That's a long time. And Revelation 20 explains a bit of that and tells us that you know, the dead in Christ, those who have been martyred for Jesus, who didn't take the mark of the beast, they're going to be raised to life and reign on this earth for a thousand years. And then the rest will happen and God's going to make a new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, and He's going to live and be with mankind forever. Ha! I can't wait. But here we are. That is yet to come. Could happen in the next five minutes. We might not, we might not get lunch today. Do you realize that? God might say, no, no potluck for you. The Canucks are doing so well this year. And I've said forever, you know, if, if, if God comes before they ever get a Stanley Cup, that'll just be it. I, I, I joke about, you know, they, they're going to be there in the playoffs, game seven, they win the game, and they're about to hoist the cup, and Jesus comes back. If you're a hockey fan, you get that. If you don't care, I totally get it too. But the truth is, he could come back. Jesus could return at any time. He says, behold, I'm coming soon. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. I'd love not to have to go through another day of watching this world suffer, of seeing Israel fighting Hamas, fighting Hezbollah, fighting every nation around them. I'd love to see Russia and Ukraine shake hands and say, why are we doing this? Let's be at peace. I'd love to see people all over this world stop suffering, the starvation happening all over the world, people dying from disease and illness, cancer has taken way too many people. People have taken way too many people. Politics are ridiculous. The world has just fallen apart. I'm tired of it. I would love for Jesus to come back. But because of his grace and mercy, he says, no, I'm leaving you here for a little while longer. I'm not coming back yet. So you can tell more people about the gospel and bring more people into the kingdom. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. Good song choice today. One of those signs is what John is telling us about here, this spirit of Antichrist. Anything that is anti-something is the opposite, or it's opposed to that thing. It's anti-something. Like, I'm anti-pumpkin pie. It's just not my thing. I don't have anything against people who like it, just I don't like it. But you could be anti-anything. Antichrist is someone who is against Jesus, opposed to him, against his teaching, who is against him, being the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way back to the Father, which is what he said and who he said he is. And if we believe that, then that means there is no other way. There is no other faith. There is no other religion that's right. It's only Jesus. Otherwise, we're fools. It's only Christ. These will try to lead others away to follow their way. To be anti-Christ is to deny that Jesus is the Christ. We're taught in the Revelation that in the final days, there will be the Antichrist. 
this world leader who's going to take people away, if it be so possible, from the faith and lead a movement against the kingdom of God. He will appear and lead people away. But John tells us already in this text that many antichrists have already come. Confusing? We have to think about what he's meaning. It's this spirit of antichrist, this feeling, this movement, this, this tendency of people to be, to be away from Jesus, to be away from Scripture, to be away from church, to be anti-Christ, anti-church, anti-Jesus. These who are opposed to the gospel of Christ, opposed to his church. How often do we people hear people say that church today isn't relevant? God, I don't believe. I don't believe there's God. I don't, he doesn't exist. Christians, they're just a bunch of hypocrites, just a bunch of fools. I, I'd say I hear that too often, and it's sad. And even within the church, there can be a spirit of division, a spirit of antichrist. John talks about people who have been once part of the church but have now left. That's who he's talking about when he says, these who have left. These were people who came to faith, came to be part of the church, and now they've moved on. Those who went out from us, is his word. It's a sad fact that some people who choose to follow Christ, choose to say yes to Jesus, choose to be part of a local church, seem to have given their life over to him, in time, fall away. In time, cease from being in fellowship. Cease from praying, reading scripture, Stop serving in any way, shape, or form. And so they leave. Perhaps never to return. Perhaps even to speak out against the church and become anti-church, anti-God, anti-Christ. Many have come. We may know some. And it's one of the saddest things to see. A life that was lived for Christ, where you saw Jesus working in their life, or at least you thought you did. John says, Scripture says, these antichrists are those who never really were true followers of Jesus. And I have to believe that. Because if someone was to have the Spirit of God truly regenerate them and make them a whole new person, forgiving them of sin, whatever sin, and rebuilding them and coming to dwell inside them, as Paul says, for that person really not to live anymore, but Christ living in me, if that's truly who we are as followers of Jesus, then I believe it would be impossible for, for a person to walk away because you've seen the light, you've seen the truth, you've walked with God, talked with God, done life with God. Nothing else compares. Amen? So how could a person walk away? How could a person become antichrist? It's because they never really knew Jesus. They never had that real, right relationship with him. They're not true believers, and their leaving demonstrates that. People have left the church for many reasons that they feel justify their decision. Now the church is just full of hypocrites. Yep. The church has hurt me in some way, perhaps. The church doesn't live up to my expectations. Oh, humility is needed. The church is too restricting on my lifestyle. Amen. Because it's not mine, it's God's to live. The church is too judgmental. Well, we're just trying to show you the truth. The church is fill in the blank. The church is filled with people who have flaws. The church is filled with people who make mistakes, who don't all like the same music, who aren't perfect, who don't like pumpkin pie, who love banana cream. There's people who like hockey, people who hate it. There's people who love getting together and people who are more to themselves. The church is filled with people who have different gifts, different talents, do things a little differently. And isn't that the beauty of the church? Is that we have all these different gifts. We're not all the same, but we bring it all together and it makes what you might describe as the most beautiful church casserole you've ever seen. All these different ingredients making something beautiful. And Jesus says, I love the church. I give my life for it. The church is my bride. It's a beautiful thing. Seeing people being transformed day by day, more and more into the image of Jesus. 
It can be a painful thing, a hurtful thing. It takes a long time sometimes. It's not necessarily instantaneous. Salvation is. Becoming more and more like Christ, that takes time. What we have is this wonderful grace and love of God that helps us to forgive each other the way he's forgiven us. Helps us to appreciate each other's differences and accepts that we're all on a journey of learning what it is like to be a Christian together. It's not my way or the highway. It's not yours either. It's God's way and no other way. Those who are true followers of Jesus Christ have a special gift, a special anointing. They know the truth. And that truth is Jesus. And that truth sets us free. To deny that Jesus is the head of this church or any church of every church is to deny that He's God. To say that Jesus isn't in control here, that His word isn't supreme, is to say we've got a better way. Talk to that church, preach to that church, but don't say you're part of that church. I'll say that publicly. A church that says there's some way other than Jesus, that somehow Scripture's messed up, that something is acceptable now just because it's 2023, is messed up. Christ the Father, Christ and the Father are one. They are the same. So to deny Christ is to deny the Father. That's what Antichrist is. Jesus said in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. We know that to be true. That's the anointing that allows us to understand God's teaching in a way that folks who don't know God can't seem to understand. Because you can't understand the Scripture until you believe in the one who wrote it. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. Not me, not the folks who translated this, no one. It's Christ. And that anointing of having His Holy Spirit dwelling within us that is the gift of eternal life. John says in verse 27, this anointing allows us not to need someone to teach us about anything, about all things. So does that mean that we don't need to come and be the church and, and do this together? That we shouldn't open up Scripture and try and learn together? Ah, uh, you all know it all. See you, have a good life. Bye. Is that what it means? No, the, the teaching that they don't need is what the truth is. We have the truth. The truth is it's Jesus and nothing else. That's the only teaching you need to know. That's the teaching we need to stick to. It's Jesus. Jesus. It's always Jesus. It's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came, who lived, who died and rose again, who ascended to heaven and is coming again. That's the truth. You don't need to know anything more than that. That is enough to save you. That's the gospel. And if we stick to that, we're good. Everything else just gets added to it. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? Put Him first in everything, and all these things will be added to you. Put Jesus first, not yourself. Jesus first, not the way you do worship. Jesus first, not the kind of pie you like. Jesus first, not anything else. Jesus first, everything else after. So what are we seeking in our life? Is it Jesus and what He's doing in and through me. Jesus, what he's doing in my family. Jesus, what he's doing in my workplace. Jesus, how he's using me and the gifts and talents and opportunities I have to affect the people around me. Or am I somehow letting Jesus get in the back seat? If anyone should be driving the wheel of your life, it's Christ. He should have the steering wheel. He should have the accelerator. He's got the gas tank full all the time. Go with Christ. Ride along and watch what he's doing and allow and follow and let him be the leader. We're the followers. We're the disciples, followers of Christ. He's the one in control. Does it mean we don't come together in home groups and discuss the Bible that we don't need to be taught? Of course not. The more we learn about what it means to be like Jesus, it's going to make us more and more like Jesus and make us want to have more people be like Jesus. Does it mean we can live the Christian life all alone? We don't need to be taught anything. I'm all good. No, you need fellowship. To pull yourself out of the church is to say, well, I'm, I'm fine just with this little bit and the rest of my life I'm, I'm, I'm okay with. I have to ask myself every day, how, how have I connected with Christ today? How, how have I been effective for Him today? What's He trying to say to me and through me today? What's He trying to do in my life today? Every day. 
Because we have that spirit of antichrist that says, no, nah, you don't need to bother today. Don't read the Bible today. Don't pray today. Don't, don't, don't try and be any better. Just be like the world. And little by little, snip by snip, bit by bit, he tries to pull us away. And if we don't really know Jesus, we won't recognize that. If we don't really know Jesus, he will get a, a finger hold. He'll get a sliver, a foot in the door, and he will slowly pry us away. But if we know Christ, if we know Jesus, if he is living and dwelling within us, then we can say, Satan, get behind me. And every fiery arrow he shoots at us, we just deflect it and say, nah, not today, buddy. You're a defeated foe. You go to hell. I'm working on getting people into the kingdom. I like having that kind of authority. Jesus gave it to us. He gave us that kind of authority. What he is saying is that Christians, as true believers, have the ability to understand Scripture and can learn from the Holy Spirit truths that will lead us and continue to keep us in eternal life. Truth that will show the spirit of Antichrist as false and truth that sets us free. The thing, though, is that we have to remain in him. And he emphasizes that at the end. Remain in me. Stay in me. Abide in me. We've got to stick to it every single day and the moments throughout the day, all the last hours we have. And not walk away when we feel we don't want to do it anymore. I'm too tired. I'm too whatever. No. Nah. When we feel uncomfortable or confused, we're not to turn away. That's when we should pray. When we feel like we, we have nothing more to learn, we should realize, I don't know nothing yet. When I realize that I, I, I have more opportunity while I'm walking and living and breathing, I have the chance to bring the gospel to someone, and I choose to sit and watch TV or sit by a lake or do nothing, I'm wasting the time I've been given. And I know in my life I need to work on this. It's a daily thing. It's a daily struggle to say, today I need to be like Christ. Today I need to follow Jesus. Today I need to hear his voice. Today I need to not harden my heart. Today I need to obey him. That's the commitment that we all need as followers of Jesus. So what do we take from this passage? Four points. And I'm going to spend about 15 seconds on each one so we can go and have some lunch. First of all, watch the clock. It is ticking. I've, I've used the analogy before. If we are silent in here, you can hear that clock at the back ticking. And the seconds tick away. That's life here in this life. What are we doing with the moments we've been given? Time on this earth is running out, and Christ will return and is coming back. Watch the signs. Be ready. Don't miss what he has for you in these last days, these last hours. Make the most of the time we have left. Secondly, read your Bible. I can never stress enough how deeply important it is to know the Word of God. It is life. It is instruction. It's the final word. It is God revealing Himself to us, and it is what allows us to know what the truth is from what the lies are. It must be a part of every day that we live. To not read it is to go to war unarmed. To go out and face battle in a place that is full of antichrist and not be prepared in how to respond to that, how to answer someone when they ask you about truth. What do you say to someone when they talk about issues of life these days? When the, the issue of same-sex marriage or homosexuality or doing drugs or doing whatever, and to say that somehow that's okay, how does that align with Scripture? If we don't know Scripture, we won't know how to answer. And people need to hear the truth because that truth can set them free. The Bible has been taken out of our schools. It's been outlawed in many nations. How long until it's restricted here in Canada? Further and further until you can't even have it anymore because it'll be seen as hate speech. Read it. Memorize it. Know it. Bury it deep in your heart. I think it was the scripture Deb referred to last week. Your word I've hidden in my heart so I might not sin against you. And so I might obey it and follow it every day in life. Don't give up on the church, thirdly. This is God's church. The gates of hell will not overcome it, though they will try. 
The church is the bride of Christ. He loves it. He loves us. And we come here to be accepted and loved despite all of our mistakes, despite all of our flaws and shortcomings. The church is where we can come for forgiveness from the Father, where we can forgive others what they've done against us to demonstrate the love of Christ to others the same way He demonstrated it to us. No matter what, this is His church. and We are His people. We're trying to be more and more like Him. Yeah, we're not the biggest church. We may not have all the big programs here, the big flashing lights or any of that stuff, but guess what? You don't need that. You need Jesus. I need to love the Father and love others as you love yourself. The rest of it, it's all just layers. It has to come down to the gospel. And finally, dream big. God is able to do more than we could ever ask and able to do more than we could even imagine. So trust Him. Serve Him. Love Him. Love and serve those around you. Show them that God is alive and well and in your life and in His church. And the devil, he's defeated. So don't live in defeat. Live in the victory that was bought by the blood of Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word today. I do trust, God, that you have spoken to us even as you've spoken to me. Challenge us, show us, and correct us in areas of our life where we may not have you first. If we've been thinking that maybe this isn't the right thing for me, maybe I need to try something else, Lord God, intervene and drive away that spirit of division. Take away that enemy of doubt and revive in us that love that we had for you at first. Restore to us the joy of our salvation. Don't take your Holy Spirit from us. Wake us up to be the church, the people, individuals, family that you want us to be. The children of God. Bought with the blood of Christ. Purchased for eternity. You paid no small price so that we might have eternal life. May we never be frivolous with it. As we walk day by day in the light of your love and your grace and your mercy, as we walk shining the light of Christ in this dark old world, Lord, we pray that others would be attracted to it. They would see the difference that Christ has made in our lives, what difference he makes in being the church, what a difference he makes in bringing hope into hopeless situations in bringing trust and assurance no matter what might happen around us. Even in this fallen, old, broken, old, divided, fighting, warring world, God, we can have peace and assurance because of Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray that we don't fall under the, the wicked spell of the enemy who would do whatever he can to try and wriggle us away out of your hand. You tell us that no one can snatch us out of your hand. May we never choose to walk away from you. And so, God, thank you for your consistency, your faithfulness and goodness, your never-changing character. Thank you for the light that shines in our path, your word that lights the way every day so that we can take step by step with you in no matter what situation we may face, knowing you're with us always, right to the very end of the age even to the end of this last hour we're living in. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your mighty name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Psalm 121 says, The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in.